We've been talking about air taxis, eVTOLs, whatever you want to call them, for quite some time now. When are we actually going to be able to pull up our phones, open an app, and summon an electric-powered air vehicle to come pick us up and take us to Brainstorm Tech? Bonnie, why don't you take us off? Sure, sure. So yes, yeah, so if we think back, even back to the Jetsons, this has been uh, a fantasy of flying cars, if you will. We're on the home stretch. We are on the home stretch, and there's quite a few operators out there that are looking at and building these out. We're targeting service in 2024, and uh, there's other operators as well. I see that this is very, very real. We are flying our aircraft now with thousands of flights. Hmm. So 2024, what exactly will it look like on that in that year? So for us, we're, uh, our initial service we're operating, we're very much leaning into our, our DOD partners. So we'll actually be operating even next year on uh, military bases here in the US, operating from one side of a base to another. And we'll build upon that experience in parallel as we're getting certification from the FAA. Now, it is a challenge in working through. We have a lot that we have a control of, and then we also have a lot that we don't, like going through the certification process. Right now, we're still targeting our service in 2024. And that will ultimately mean operating. Our goal is to have that app. So the, the vision is you've, you're in downtown LA, you're in downtown New York, and you need to get to the airport. So you can pull up the app, and you, can, you could pull up an app, on, and maybe even our partners, say Uber. And you could take a car, and it might take you an hour and a half, there's traffic. Or you could have this multimodal service where a car picks you up, brings you right to the Vertiport or Heliport, brings you to, right directly to the airport, and bring you into the terminal, take you maybe 15 minutes, at roughly the same cost. That's how, our, that's how we're operating. So there are other startups talking about the year 2024 as well, like Volocopter as an example. James, I would like to hear your perspective. I know that you work very closely with the FAA. Sure. So based on your conversations with the, regulate, the regulator of this industry, what do you think is realistic here? I think, uh, well, first you mentioned the Jetsons, and, and ironically, <laughs> the Jetsons actually did have a theoretical date of, of the series. It was supposed to be 2061. So oh. actually, well, there you go. so we're of way ahead of we're schedule. Ahead of <laughs> so I, I think, you know, unfortunately, aviation, as, as Bob yes. can attest, aviation is one of the very regulated industries. We have a few industries that are very regulated. And as, as such, uh, you know, the society has a high expectation for safety and our regulations reflect that societal acceptance. I, I anticipate, um, I, I would basically pose it as, as when would we have the potential for ubiquity? And I, I would say the potential for ubiquity would be within this decade. Uh, and, and ubiquity is where it's going to be possible in lots of different places on, yeah. on a wide scale. I, uh, the certification is going to be the tough part. And uh, what has happened is, is I'm an aerospace engineer, and historically in aviation, it took a long time to develop a vehicle. So it took a decade or so to develop something. And our regulations kind of matched that. You know, it took a long time to do type certification, uh, a production certification, things like that. Now, we have kind of this new era of aviation, especially with electric propulsion, where we're able to design systems much faster. But our regulatory system has not really kept pace. It's really the, what's dragging us down. Uh, the enormous economic investment and activity that's happened because of eVTOL and a, uh, advanced air mobility is putting a pressure on the FAA that has never really existed. We've had a lot of, of uh, uh, political pressure for drones and things like that in the past, but we've never had the economic pressure that we have now. So the FAA is trying to react. That's the big wild card for this industry is when will the FAA be able to adapt to how quickly this industry is moving? Because FAA thus far, uh, our regulatory system has not kept pace with technology at all. Um, and ironically, you know, I, I work a lot with a, a lot of the companies doing drone delivery. I predict the same with drone delivery. I think ubiquity in terms of having drone delivery in lots of locations is more on the scale of 2030. So it's, 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 it's kind of the questions if, if we, we may be able to have some isolated cases, but I, I would say within this decade, we have the potential for ubiquity in wild scale operation. So. Is there anything besides regulation in particular that's keeping these aircraft out of the skies right now? Well, the, a lot of the aircraft, I mean, we're there, and it's not just Joby. We have several, again, I mean, this is, there's an ecosystem here. If it, if it were just Joby, it would probably be a harder path, but because of the ecosystem and the investment that, that's in it, and we have, you know, dozens of operators who are actually flying the aircraft now. Uh, and so the, the certification is one part, which we don't have as much control over, although we're well into that certification. We are leading in that space uh, and working daily with the FAA 
on those on the processes. And then it's also just scaling up the operation. So it is a capital intensive business. And uh, so building out the manufacturing process, it's, it's great to build one aircraft, but you have to build dozens and then hundreds and thousands of them to meet the ubiquitous scale there. So for us, we're thinking about that in the long, in the long haul as well. I want to circle back to the point about funding a little later, but sure. Bonnie, I do want to ask you, so in February, um, one of your prototypes mm -hmm. crashed. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us exactly what happened and has that delayed any of your plans for commercial launch at all? So first of all, it has not delayed anything. So I'll talk a little bit about, so in uh, earlier this year, our second prototype aircraft came off the production line. So when you have two assets, now that allows you to do a lot more. Our first air asset had over a thousand flights on it. And we operate, and although the aircraft are intended to be piloted while we're doing the flight test phase, we, we've built our aircraft so it can be remotely flown. So now that we had two assets, we're able to take our first one and do what we call envelope expansion. And what that means is the normal, op if you think about the normal operating range of an aircraft in this, this area here, envelope expansion means operating it far beyond the limits so that you can see where those limits are. And when you're doing flight tests, it's possible that you're going to exceed whatever the limits end up to be, and that's indeed what happened for that. But we were able to very quickly work through the investigation, and we've had our second aircraft flying. We have our third aircraft coming off the production line soon. So we're back, back on track, and it actually, if anything, is, is helping because it helps us see where are those limits and then take that learning and, and apply it back into our next aircraft. Mm -hmm. James, I want to turn to you to talk about the funding question here. So really over the past decade, venture capitalists have been pouring hundreds of millions of dollars into eVTOL companies. Um, some of them have gone public. There's been a lot of funding in this space, but we've entered a new kind of market where there's, we're not sure if there's such an appetite for unprofitable companies. So I, I'm curious to hear your perspective on whether you think these companies are continue to get funding and will continue to be able to put millions of dollars into this technology. I, I think the, the big question, um, if we look at another analogy, if we look at drones, uh, my opinion is we're really in the second wave. And we had a first wave where there were a lot of failures. And the regulatory system didn't keep pace. I think a lot of the business plans and, and were unrealistic. So we had a lot of failures, big, big failures. But now we have some pretty healthy companies that are part of the second wave that didn't even really exist a few years ago. And so we're seeing a second wave really take off and do well. And I think the big question is will this first, I, I, my opinion, AAM is really in that first wave. And it may be the first wave that makes it through. But I think the problem is going to be, are we going to be able to sustain that regulatory progress? Um, and I do think it will take a lot of political pressure to, to do that. Um, there's a lot of things, you know, we, we are still grounded in, in the way we've, we think about aviation in the old, old ways. Uh, a lot of the, the, the regulations are based on antiquated ideas of, you know, very mechanical propulsion systems and maintenance cycles and operator requirements and things like that. A lot of those things go away with electric propulsion, but the regulations stay. And we could probably share all sorts of funny stories of how we've had to adapt just to accommodate unrealistic expectations. No joke, we, when we first started flying drones, uh, there, there were regulations, Part 91, you had to carry your flight manual on board. Well, there's no pilot on board a drone, and so in order to satisfy the FAA, we would put it on a zip drive and tape it on the side of the drone. It was never going to be used, and the FAA would say, yes, you have your flight manual on board. You're good. But that's the type of stuff that we're still dealing with, I think, in a lot of ways, just across aviation. We have not really modernized. Uh, you know, to, so I, I think it, it, what, what remains to be seen, are we going to be able to maintain, because there's tremendous momentum, can we maintain that momentum to overcome that regulatory inertia and, and see this first wave actually be the successful yeah, wave? I, I can and, build on that a little bit. Yeah, yeah. so we, uh, we started 12 years ago and actually partnered with um, the, the GAMA, the General Aviation uh, uh, Manufacturing Association, and built out and built out new regulations, and 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 we'll call it Part 23, new regulations that'll adapt with the technologies. And we've been partnering along on building our aircraft on that. There's been some slight change. However, the FAA has accepted and realized how far we are along in this process, and the electrification is part of it. So you're right. It, electrification totally changes. The, the game here in terms of operations, in terms of maintenance, in terms of reliability, uh, and it brings a lot more safety into, the, into play as well. So um, the regulations are, are evolving, and those that are kind of in the lead are, are helping to move this along. We just, you know, we've been meeting with uh, the administrator, had a good 
um, story in 60 Minutes recently, talking about how the idea, even though regulations are adapting, that to not slow down the certification process. Mm -hmm. Bonnie, can you talk more about the funding piece in particular? I know sure. that you used to be at JetBlue Ventures, so yeah. you're very familiar with the venture space. Um, this is a very capital intensive business. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, what kind of position is Joby in after going public via SPAC in 2000, end of 2020? I uh, it was uh, last year. Last, last year. year, yeah. So, um, yeah, I started actually, and I've been coming here to brainstorm for many years uh, on the venture side. So, I worked at, at JetBlue Ventures, and at JetBlue, we felt that electric propulsion would fundamentally change aviation just like Jet Propulsion did back in the 60s. I mean, and this was back in 2017. We canvassed the entire uh, um, electric propulsion and eVTOL space and settled on Joby. We invested in Joby back then. And ultimately, I've come to believe in how the model is working so much, I, I've come in-house. And it is capital intensive, um, but what we've done with the, at Joby is because we started 12 years ago, we were able to you know, build that sort of scrappy, how to work scrappy and keep keep tight with our, our, um, our funds. We were able to go public last year. We've got 1.2 billion on the balance sheet uh, as of close of um, the last quarter. And we're very judiciously working through what we're doing in this year and next year and next year so that we can maintain that funding base and give a good balance sheet um, until we hit commercial operations. So, uh, but it does take, in this, this downturn, there may be some that don't make it. There may be some that don't make it. Um, those that then specify who you think might not. <laughs> <laughs> Look again. I'm going to say that this is a, a broad ecosystem, and we we want multiple players to make it because if it were just only one, um, the FA may not be as uh, as accommodating, right? They really yes, want to work yeah. with multiple players. I'm not going to say which which ones, and who knows, right? You just never know. <laughs> uh, but uh, this is going to be an interesting call it three years. Mm -hmm. Well, it's no secret that there is a severe lack of diversity in the aviation industry, mm -hmm. and I know that both of you are very passionate about this yes. topic. Bonnie, you're a pilot. James, you work for the Choctaw Nation. You're very committed to bringing tribal members into this industry. So can both of you talk just a little bit about your experience and what can companies do to bring more people of color, more, more women into this industry? Sure, this is an area I'm very, very passionate about. And when I first looked at, at the eVTOL space, I said, well, autonomous aircraft, that's gonna take a long time for public adoption. But a piloted aircraft, we had a pilot shortage. And it's very much, I mean, many of you, even the, the aviation system is being stressed as we speak because of lack of pilots. So what if you add more pilots? How could we do that? Well, then I started thinking, when, when I became an airline pilot 30 years ago, 2% of airline pilots were female. Three decades later, we're at 6%. Why? It's a structural issue. It is difficult to raise a family when you're gonna be gone three or four days a week and in other cities. Well, in the eVTOL space can actually solve that because by design, our aircraft don't fly all-nighters, they don't fly transcons or international, so you'll be home every night. So we are very much leaning into, and our goal is to is to capture and the imagination of the young women and show the career paths and that you can continue this career. So right now, 15% uh, of student pilots are female. The current path, they'll um, drop out uh, by the time before they hit their commercial license. Our goal is to increase the student pilots and then have them come to the eVTOL space and then grow and learn, in the, learn the craft here and they can move on to be airline pilots later if they wish. And, and the way we're engaging that is, um, you know, from my own background, I, I grew up in a very impoverished area. I grew up in the heart of the Choctaw Nation, and both sides of my family go back. I'm actually the first college graduate in my family, uh, paid my own way through school. Uh, you know, it wasn't uh, encouraged that you went to college. And so I've lived that. It's almost a learned helplessness. You know, why try? Uh, because you look around, your cousins aren't doing things. And I've, I've seen what happens, and it really takes us working all the way down to the fifth or sixth grade level to build confidence, and especially with young females. Uh, when I went through engineering school with, for my degrees, it was not uncommon to have a, a class of engineering students with a single female and all the rest male. And I thought, I, if surely in 20 or 30 years, there's going to be more balance, and we really have not met that balance. And it really goes back to the lower levels. Uh, people, young people form the opinion of what I can do, what I should do, what I'm supposed to do early on. And what it takes is confidence from adults. They need to have that confidence that you're capable of doing it because there's a lot more people capable of things like engineering, but they're not 
put in an environment where they get to build that confidence. And so we're trying, is all of the technology things we're doing with the Choctaw Nation, one of the most important parts is we're working very closely with the schools to try to build that STEM pipeline because whether they come back and work with things within the Choctaw Nation or they go off, we still, we're still embedding their lives. Um, but it's still a problem. There's still a lot of societal um, encumbrances and influences that sort of influence young people and what they choose. And we, we have to work very hard. And, and those of us who have, are in tech, it's, it's very important for us to help do what we can to try to influence more people. Let people know, especially young kids, these are great opportunities. You're capable of it. They need that confidence. And that's something that's important to us. And it's, it's something as, as a whole tech industry we have to take on. Before I keep going, do we have any questions from the audience at this point? Okay, I'll keep going then. So Joby's been doing this for 12 years. How important is it to be the first company going out the gates, getting in the air? So uh, we are leading in the space. We are uh, ahead in both the certification process and um, the capital. And, you know, it's a big ecosystem, right? So there's, there's going to be a lot of room, you know, whether it's in Tokyo, in London, New York, Miami, there's a lot of space for a lot of players. I think being first does open up new opportunities for us. One of the things that Joby is um, very passionate about and where we think public adoption is important is around noise. And we've designed, part of the reason we've spent as long as we have in designing our aircraft is how quiet it is. And recently NASA um, did a study to sort of prove our design um, uh, concepts where when the aircraft flies overhead, it's almost silent. Uh, think of it as leaves in the wind. Uh, and at 45 decibels. Uh, on the ground at 65 decibels, which is about what a conversation will be. So I, when I try to explain what it sounds like, like think of a home air conditioner outside and you're standing next to it, that's what it sounds like on takeoff. And so that, by getting that into the communities to see that this doesn't have that whiny noise or it doesn't have you know, loud chop, 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 chop like a helicopter, that will help with adoption for the entire industry. Well, James, Bonnie, thank you so much for coming and thanks for listening. Thank you.